Yeah, and and I, I think it's also a perception of risk. Like if you think, for example, road cycling, that people are uh, <laughs> riding with the road bikes on the on normal streets when they are training and the cars are going like 60, 60 miles per hour. So that's that's really dangerous. But we don't really consider road cycling usually as dangerous sport. Of course, there, there's dangers in all sports. You know, uh, there's huge dangers in, in distance running. You know, one of the most popular things for people to do, you know, especially if it's, you know, the height of summer and someone's dehydrated or has an underlying health condition that they're not aware of, um, you know, they're running their first marathon. It happens very, very frequently. It's obviously, it's very tragic that, you know, people do do suffer very serious um, injuries and even die um, in all kinds of sports. So, yes, there, there is a, a sense perhaps that combat sports are more dangerous than others because the action is is you know, circling back to the violence question again, it looks like mm-hmm. violence. It looks like, you know, the intention is to to wound and harm each other. Um, and of course, we do have injuries, but it's not necessarily that much more dangerous or that much worse than some of the risks that people are taking in other sports as well. And that's very much the line that the the medical staff I spoke to would, you know, would, would say, I don't think this is any worse than football or any worse than, you know, rugby and so on. Mm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And and do you think in the UK there should be more regulation, for example, in MMA? Uh, yes, uh, as, a, as a short answer, I absolutely think there should be. Um, this is one of the, the big headlines to come out of this study. In fact, the first paper we published, um, the title was a need for standardized regulatory frameworks that we at the moment we do have as uh, so we have the, the, the England boxing that regulate amateur boxing in the UK. We have the British Boxing Board of Control that regulate professional boxing. Um, We have boxing shows that can happen outside of their remit. So Mm. you don't have to be a member or, or, you know, adhere to the rules of either body to stage a boxing show, Um, which kind of makes a mockery of having them, to be honest. You know, if if we've got a governing body that isn't governing, um, it raises some very serious questions. In mixed martial arts, we do have a, a new or relatively new governing body, the the English Mixed Martial Arts Association. Um, A group of people I think are very well-meaning and and very well-intentioned who know the sport very well and and want to develop it in very positive um, ways to professionalize and to improve standards and so on. Um, Very active, particularly with respect to the amateur scene, um, working in conjunction with the International Mixed Martial Arts Federation. And it's great to see this, but again, they, they don't really govern the sport in the sense that you know, if, if you don't want to adhere to their regulations, there's nobody compelling you to. So um, it, it's a bit of a shame, really. You know, we have a lot of effort that's being put in to, to develop and improve things. But at the moment, you know, if I wanted to put on an, an MMA show next week, all I would need is, is a bunch of fighters and a venue. Mm. You know, and it's it's a, obviously I'd need some money as well. But yes, it, it wouldn't be there, there's nobody looking over my shoulder to make sure I do it right. And that I think is a problem. Yeah, that's that's the impression I I got in in UK when I was when I was there. I think in Finland, for example, it's it's much more regulated. But uh, you have also looked into the referees. Could you tell more about this this study and setup? Absolutely, yeah. So this was uh, the latest paper that I published. Um, it's about referees um, in the the journal um, Qualitative Research in Sport, Exercise, and Health, and the referees data came out of the study on medics. It wasn't my intention initially. And, um, you know, we we're very much focused on the medical staff, but after the first two or three shows that we went to, pardon me, uh, the first two or three shows, it was pretty obvious that the referee was a very important character, not only in terms of the actual um, fights themselves, but in, in the wider context of the events that we were attending. Um, the referee effectively um, it acts like a bit of a stage manager. Uh, particularly at lower level, regional, amateur and and low level professional events. The referee does so much more than just refereeing the fights. They're usually the most experienced person there. They're usually um, someone who's quite well known as well. They'll they'll be known on the circuit. They will have refereed uh, matches that the fighters will have seen, that they would have watched, that the coaches might have fought in one of their, their bouts that they refereed. They've probably also had a career as a fighter themselves. Um, and quite often, too, they'd be on television from time to time. So you would have seen this referee, oh, he was refereeing on Bellator last week, or he was refereeing on on, um, on Cage Warriors or UFC. So the referee has um, 
generally, at least, the referee tends to have a fair bit of respect in these environments. They're very well established members of the community. And because of that, it's almost natural that they take a kind of leadership role in managing and, and organising the events. Even if it's not part of their job description, they, they rise to that. And it became quite clear to me, you know, I need to speak to these, these people because they are um, a key point of contact for the medic. They're a key point of um, well authority during the fight itself. Um, there's a, a really interesting question over you know, who actually stops a fight? Is it the referee or is it the medic? You know, and, and there was a bit of disagreement with, with some of my sample on that as well, um, which was very interesting. So, yes, it, it became obvious that referees are important. So I decided to, on the side of, of gathering data about the medics, also to, if I could, interview referees. Um, towards the end of the study, I started to shift it over so that I was solely interested in referees. And I went to um, two mixed martial arts events where I shadowed the referee team specifically. Um, as well as uh, two others um, shortly after my, my colleagues did. Um, as well as that, I interviewed um, seven referees and I got to see, um, God, off the top of my head, I think 10 other referees throughout the sample. I got to see them during the, you know, the course of the study as they worked um, and spoke with them as well. Um, and finally, I also attended a referee training seminar, which was great fun. So I got to see lots of um, aspiring referees um, and learn from um, you know very senior referees uh, in, in mixed martial arts, uh, which was really really great. So I got to see a lot of how referees work and how they how they get trained and so on. Mm, yeah, really really interesting studies and and then you wrote about the how the referees are managing risk in the in the sport. Could you tell more about this? Absolutely, yeah. So there's there's a lot of things that I could have written about with the, the data I got from the referees, and I plan to uh, I plan to continue to to write this up over the next couple of years. Um, but one of the things that was that was perhaps most interesting, first of all, was how they manage risk. And you know, in the wider literature on on refereeing um, that we have in sports sociology and sports psychology, um, this hasn't really been a theme that's that's come out much. Um, there's been some really f- fantastic research that looks at you know referees' career motivations referees communication styles their relationships with players lots of fascinating stuff um, but not much that had looked specifically at this particular aspect of referees roles and I think that's probably because most referees in sport don't have a particularly strong responsibility for managing risk their job is to, it's, it's not necessarily preoccupied with that there are other people who do this um, and their work is mostly centering on on the sport and the action and, and sort of maintaining fairness and order and so on so I thought, you know, this is quite interesting. You know, this is a unique thing. Let's let's have a little look at this. And what the paper sort of reports on is the referee, on the one hand, in, in a mixed martial arts fight, the referee is responsible for keeping the fighters safe. And this is the first thing that all the referees told me when I said, hey, can you tell me about your job? What is it that you do? Okay, number one priority, always keep the fighters safe. And sometimes that means, you know, I have to intervene against their wishes you know, which I said before, you know, fighters are too brave for their own good. That came came through and pretty much every referee said that numerous times uh, when I interviewed them. Fighters will never accept defeat. They always, you know, try to, you know, push further than they, they really can. So obviously that's a, a key thing. I have to intervene on the fighter's behalf when they aren't capable of, uh, you know, willing to, to do it for themselves. So the referee has to proactively kind of... Um, stop a fight and against the fighters wishes sometimes against the crowd's wishes as well against the the wishes of their coaches so in that sense the referee has this responsibility in the sport to to stand up and do something that in the moment might be quite unpopular um but it's a key key element of the sport and and uh, making sure that the sport is sustainable that we don't end up with fighters dying we don't end up with very negative press for the sport we don't end up with the sport you know bottoming out from being you know this barbaric uh, excessive nasty thing that a lot of its critics say it is so the referee in that sense they see themselves not only managing risk to the athlete's well-being but also managing risk to the wider reputation of the sport that they love of mixed martial arts um, and even if it makes them unpopular in the moment they you know they, they they take that as a badge of honor that you know i will always do what i need to keep the athlete safe so that was the first sort of major thing they're managing risk to the athletes and, and managing risk to the sport at the same time um, and this is what the, the paper sort of centers on, is that there's a, a peculiar kind of contradiction here in that referees also often will act in ways that place fighters at risk. Um, this is most principally concerned with the, the stand-up mechanism. 
Uh, so listeners who aren't familiar with mixed martial arts, when um, because it's multidiscipline fighting, you can punch each other, you can kick each other, you can throw them on the floor, you can wrestle, grapple on the floor. Sometimes when a fight falls to the floor, it can go nowhere. It ends up in a stalemate and it moves very, very slowly while one person just sort of lies on top of the other, controlling their movement. Um, it's boring for the fans. Nobody wants to watch five minutes of that. Um, and it's not particularly great for the athletes either. It particularly, you know, if, if one person is very tired and they've got a good position, they can just use that position to rest. And it's, you know, they're not really fighting in that moment. It, it sort of becomes, um, you know, the action, it goes very stale. So the, the rules of mixed martial arts enable referees to stop fighters if they're on the floor doing nothing, to stop them and stand them up um, and restart the action from, um, you know, from the sort of familiar situation of, of two people facing off against each other. They can use this in other circumstances as well, but it's typically um, on the floor when they, when they do this. So when the referees stand fighters up, obviously a change in the pace occurs. We go from very, very slow, not much happening, very little risk, we could say, um, to suddenly we have to deal with punches and kicks coming our way again. So more risk. And uh, as I've reported on in the paper, there was one incident in my, my field work that exemplified this very, very clearly. Exactly this thing happened. The referee stands up two fighters who had been inactive and seconds after that somebody got knocked down with a with a hefty shot to the jaw so the referee's intervention immediately created a situation that was more risky uh, for the athletes so in that sense what i've argued is that referees at the same time as they manage risk and keep fighters safe they also at times um, produce risk and maintain risk and keep fighters in a situation where they're actually in danger albeit you know with, within the mm. You know, the, the familiar norms of of, um, of combat sports. So it's not, you know, they're not handing it to anyone any knives or anything, you know, they're just maintaining the natural progression of um, of the uh, of the action. So it, the paper really, it sort of tries to square that circle and explain that contradiction from the referee's point of view. Um, how can they, on the one hand, emphasize safety for the athletes, but also on the same time, uh, promote and defend and celebrate and um, instigate action within a sport that actually puts athletes at risk. Hmm. Yeah, and and of course the referees, as you said, many of them have done it by themselves, so they they know quite a bit that some things might look bad, even though they are not. For example, bleeding. You might have a small cut, and it, it might bleed quite a bit, and it looks really nasty, but basically is is just small cut. So I I think they know quite well also what is what is actually going on. Yeah, definitely. And and the referees that I spoke to, they all had quite a strong empathy with, with the athletes. You know, they, they would speak about them, um, you know, in much the same way as we talked about earlier, there's this kind of shared identity, this community, you know, this is our sport um, and I love this sport and I want to enable people to enjoy it as I have. Um, and I think actually this explains why um, people in mixed martial arts were so happy to work with us on this study is they wanted they, they wanted the opportunity to help us as, as researchers to see the sport that they loved in the way that they saw it you know so the chance to talk on on record about why you do this and what you what you love about it was you know was really appealing to them um, and absolutely there is that sense of empathy that sense of camaraderie uh, that defines the ways um, the referees think about the athletes and and shapes the way they yeah they they care for them and look after their sport and with respect to you know the stand up thing i i, I don't want to mischaracterize this for, for your listeners this isn't about the referees you know throwing the athletes to the dogs it's not they're not making things worse for them they are basically enabling the action that the athletes want to do and this mm. circles back a little bit to our consent discussion earlier athletes want the action of mixed martial arts nobody really wants to be stuck in a stalemate for five minutes three rounds in a row you know we want to have that fast-paced action and referees um, need to have the skill and the the right judgment to facilitate that action without being so involved that they end up changing the direction of the fight. So that's really where it resides. It's it's about maintaining the essence of a sport defined by risk in the interests of everybody, you know, in the interests of the athletes, um, in the interests of the fortunes of the sport, um, and ultimately in the interests of, of the fans who, um, you know, who enjoy it. Mm, yeah, really, really interesting. And then if we go to the referees, decision making when to call a fight uh, when it's over how how do they make these these difficult decisions 
So yeah, the criteria that referees will use um, in mixed martial arts, the the you know the set criteria is that when a fighter is no longer defending themselves, no longer actively um, able to defend themselves, then the referee will stop the fight. So if you've watched mixed martial arts, you will see that the referee usually will lean in very close to the action. If if one fighter is on the floor and the other person's on top, you know, punching them. If the other fighter is simply lying on the floor, covering themselves up, the referee will lean in close and they'll they'll give them an instruction. They'll say, fight back, fight back or I'll stop it. And then they stop it. So the fighter is no longer trying to, um, some, some referees use the term intelligently defend themselves. So if they're purposefully moving, trying to counter um, if they're if they're being hit, if they're not successfully um, defending themselves, the referee will stop it at that that moment. Um, so that sometimes will be a case where a fighter simply isn't responding enough; they're not they're not active enough. Uh, and often you'll see in those cases, um, some fighters will turn around and be very angry at the referee because they didn't feel like they were being damaged. They didn't feel like they were being you know successfully overpowered. They felt quite safe. Um, but if they weren't active, if they weren't intelligently um, defending and, and giving that that impression to the referee, then the referee w- may very well um, intervene to stop it, um, regardless of how they feel about it afterwards. In other situations, of course, it's a lot clearer. <laughs> the person gets knocked unconscious. The referee will will dive across and say no, and <laughs> stop, no more, um, which isn't always needed, but sometimes uh, sometimes it is. Um, so yeah, referees will stop a fight when when a fighter is no longer able to uh, intelligently defend themselves. The way they reach that decision. Um, and this is a point of, of um, you know, strong contention for the referees that I interviewed. You cannot really understand when to make those decisions if you don't have a, a strong working knowledge of the sport of mixed martial arts itself. And this is particularly the case with, um, I mean, it's fairly obvious when, you, when you're talking about striking, okay? A person punching another, we, know, we all know what that looks like. It's, it's very visceral. It's very, very clear. When someone is, is punching somebody and that person is covering up, okay, this is done. But when it comes to um, grappling, particularly with jujitsu, this is something that most people don't understand. You don't really have a very strong knowledge of what's happening to a person when they're being held in a certain type of hold, unless you've experienced that yourself, or you spent a long time in and around the sport to understand, you know, a triangle choke is likely to render somebody unconscious or an arm bar is likely to, to break their elbow. If a referee is overseeing a mixed martial arts fight and they don't understand these things, um, and this is again something that I've, I've reported on in, in one of my recent publications, um, if a referee doesn't have that knowledge, then they could fail to uh, intervene when they need to. So mm-hmm. an example of this would be somebody's caught in a particular hold and the referee doesn't understand that this is a choke hold and the person who's being choked has passed out unconscious you know, their, their blood supply is cut off to their brain. They're, they're gone. They're done. At that point, you know, they didn't tap out. At that point, the referee needs to stop the fight because this person is, is beaten. They cannot intelligently defend themselves. Their opponent has probably been coached to not stop the fight until the referee tells them to. Mm-hmm. That's one of the norms of mixed martial arts competition is that the referee is the one that ends the fight, not, you know, not the opponent, no, no matter how, um, you know, uh, clear it might be that your opponent's beaten you should work to the referee it's like in, in football you know you play to the whistle that's the the saying right hmm. so in that situation if a referee is not knowledgeable enough about the techniques being used to intervene that actually puts the the losing fighter in a very dangerous position um, and i saw this actually happen with somebody being choked unconscious and the referee didn't realize um, and it wasn't until the other fighter told the referee <laughs> that he's unconscious that the the referee broke the action and this, I heard stories that were similar to this from several people. Um, you know, the extent of, of damage that, that some athletes had unnecessarily absorbed because the referee in charge of the fight didn't know what they were doing. And quite a few of the referees that I interviewed spoke, you know, very strongly um, about this. They had very strong opinions, as you can probably imagine, um, about the, um, the proliferation of badly trained and very underqualified referees. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. So you need to have good referees who understand the sport, and and I I think it's different. The making of decision in MMA is different. Like for example, in in kickboxing or Thai boxing, you can have the standing eight count, so you can easily intervene and you can mm-hmm. check what's going on. So you basically have much longer time to make the decision, and you can also. 
ask, ask the medical stuff. So I, I think that's different. And I think also people might have a misconception. They usually see professional fights and, but in the amateur fights, the referees are intervening much easier and it can be a continuum. When do mm-hmm. they intervene? That's true. And in fact, I, I did include um, a, a little bit of detail on this in the paper that was recently published, but I had to remove it in the end because I ran out of space. Um, and that's something that I, that I chopped. But yes, there, there is um, a lot of referees will make a very clear distinction between amateur and professional fights and that they will stop an amateur fight much sooner um, in the interest of preserving you know, the fighter's safety and their, their ability to continue training and, and fight again you know, in a few few weeks or months time. Um, because they know, you know, you don't have a career riding on this. You know, there's no there's no real point in in exposing you to any danger beyond, you know, when a, a point that I'm satisfied that the fight is finished. Um, so with a professional, they might give them a little bit longer, uh, maybe give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, but with amateur fights, yeah, they're, they're much happier to intervene quicker. Um, and that's reflected in, in the different rule sets that we have uh, for, you know, in, in use for amateur and um, professional fights. And the different age age rule sets as well that we have from the um, uh, the IMAF uh, regulator. Mm, yeah, as a as an amateur, you need to go to work on Monday, and as a professional, you can have three months of relaxing. Of course, of course, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this has been really really interesting discussion. Is there any any themes you'd like to bring up? Um, I think we could probably circle back briefly to the um, the consent question. Yeah. Because um, one of the other the things that I published recently was a, a paper, again, with Chris Matthews on how athletes communicate consent. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I think your listeners might be be interested in, particularly in, in the coaching context. Um, this is a, clearly a, an important issue in combat sports. You know, as we discussed earlier, consent is crucial for this fighting violence distinction, which is you know, part of the essence of combat sports and people in martial arts and combat sports will at some point have uh, reflected and thought about this, maybe not quite as philosophically and and as as clearly as we've done today, but they will have had some thinking about this because it's so integral to, um, you know, the difference between what we do in sport and the, you know, the same actions having very negative um, connotations outside of sport. But equally, this, this kind of thing applies to all sports contexts that athletes, um, need to give their consent in order for the actions that take place in sport to be, um, you know, morally permissible um, and ultimately legal, right? The, the kind of action that goes on in, in all contact sports, if we were to do those things to somebody randomly in the street, suddenly just rugby tackle someone or, you know, body check them into the, into the, uh, into the wall, you know, <laughs> we'd probably, uh, we'd probably be arrested for it. So, um, and, and consent is the principle that, you know, the, the legal principle, certainly, and also the moral principle that makes that difference um, work. So one of the questions that we recently posed um, is, how is it that athletes communicate consent to each other and to their coaches and to referees and to other players who who manage and facilitate sport? And we were really kind of surprised, to be honest, to find that there's very little research on this, actually. Um, so in the sociology of sport, in the, the literature on sport coaching, um, very little research attention to this question. Um, there is a book, I should probably signpost this book, fantastic study uh, written in 2016 um, by uh, Jill Weinberg, who's uh, an American academic who studied, um, which is a very interesting comparative study actually between mixed martial arts and BDSM, uh, which some people might not think of as, as very similar, but uh, in her analysis, you know, that's a, you know, sadomasochism, um, sexual sadomasochism practices. Uh, a very interesting analysis of how the culture of consent in these these uh, these activities is worked out, and some of the similarities and differences between them. Uh, but that really that was the only direct study that we found to date of how athletes actually communicate consent with each other. Um, and I thought, you know, well, we, we both thought this is surely this is ground for for some interesting research. So yes, we published a paper that was um, based off of our our joint projects and our individual research over the last ten years on combat sports, looking at how athletes have communicated consent to one another, how they talk about consent, what kind of culture exists in different gyms and different competitive settings uh, that makes consent either um, sort of a very clearly foregrounded thing, that it's a normalized thing that we express consent to each other, or something that gets pushed a little bit, you know, to the side and not really, not really thought about. And often what tends to happen 
um, and certainly in, in combat sports, but I think in a lot of sports contexts, is we end up with this kind of consent that is just assumed. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that your presence in this space is enough to communicate to me that you are happy with what goes on in this space. So you wouldn't step into the boxing ring if you weren't okay with being punched. You know, you wouldn't come to the, the football pitch if you weren't okay with being slide tackled. And I think in the vast majority of cases, that's probably true, you know, and, and most athletes would would say, yeah, that's that's how I think. That's, you know, that's, there's no problem uh, with that for me. But what in, we do in the paper is we highlight a few examples where that's not enough, really. And actually, to kind of circle back to one of the points we made right at the start here, there are times when athletes are involved in sports where they haven't really consented or they're, they're expected to do things that they wouldn't otherwise consent to if not for, you know, a power difference. Maybe a coach has, has kind of forced them to do something. We've, we've got questions around safeguarding, questions around, you know, athletes' agency. Um, or perhaps people are being economically coerced into things. Perhaps there's a lot of peer pressure um, that I really don't want to be here, but I don't want to let my side down. So, you know, I'm injured, but I'm going to hide it so that I don't let the team down. So there's lots of questions that we could ask, actually, that when we just assume consent by somebody's presence, that's not the whole picture. You know, we wouldn't assume consent um, in, a, in, you know, in sexual context just because somebody goes on a date. That doesn't necessarily mean that they consent to um, to sex, right? If somebody turns up to a, a boxing gym, that doesn't necessarily mean they consent to sparring. So what we try to argue for is that we need a bit more research on um, on how we recognize consent and how perhaps we can educate coaches to foster um, sort of more positive climates of, of respecting and uh, recognizing consent. Mm, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I've been in, in gyms in many different different countries and I think the communication of the consent especially for example sparring it's it's important and Mm -hmm. and in my opinion it should be that it's not the consent like you cannot bully anyone you cannot you cannot be violent it needs to be harmony where you kind of start light and you negotiate usually non-verbally how Mm -hmm. how it goes and you pay attention you you right away notice from someone's facial expression if you go too far if you actually pay attention i think so i I think it should be this kind of harmonious increase of of intensity to certain point and then stopping there and going going on how how, how do you how do you see it should be done yeah i I agree and that's one of the things that we wrote about in the paper actually that there is there's very very rarely or very few examples of directly negotiating verbally um, over what we consent to. Sometimes in sparring, for instance, we would say, um, the coach might say, uh, you know, go easy on each other, don't kill each other out there, talk to each other if you've got an injury, you know. So there is that that kind of, that does happen sometimes. And I've recounted a few examples of my own training where my partner and I have verbally negotiated consent. But yes, the, the vast majority of times what I think happens in, in the gym is usually there'll be um, either the sort of, uh, we call these the, the conventionally recognized gestures. So in boxing, it's a, uh, you know, let's touch gloves. There we go. Let's, let's spar in jujitsu. It's the, you know, the, the slap and the bump. Mm. Lots of different sports have those kind of gestures that say, okay, I'm ready now to start. Um, and that, that I think is, is not necessarily problematic. So long as people were aware that that's the purpose of that gesture. It's not just a ritual that we go through the motions with. It's an indication to my partner that I'm ready and I'm happy. Um, and equally, yes, that what you mentioned there, um, intensity negotiation, that's been written about by a few scholars who've studied combat sports. Um, so yes, they haven't specifically written about it as a form of consent, but it's a, a very interesting sociological process where people uh, get socialized into understanding those cues. And after they've been involved in uh, in boxing or Muay Thai or MMA for a, for a time, they pick up on that kind of body language, those kind of unspoken truths that help them to uh, manage and negotiate the intensity of sparring. There's a couple of papers that I've reviewed this year, actually, that are just exactly about this topic. So I'm very excited for them to be published later on. I'm keeping an eye out for those. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting topic. And that's how consent is is largely managed in practice. It's not verbal. It's not formal. Uh, it's done through this kind of implicit, um, yeah, nonverbal communication, or it's done through the assumption um, process, often sort of a, a mix of those two. What I think would be better is if people, um, you know, we, we get away from the assumption of consent and we, we work more towards having a kind of a literacy 
uh, and, and establish a literacy of how to read and understand those nonverbal cues. And particularly, I think the onus there is on coaches and coach educators to put consent at the heart of, uh, you know, understanding how to manage uh, a social environment, how to manage the, um, you know, the interactions that take place in your clubs, in your gyms, um, to make sure that people are aware of the importance of consent and can recognise that adequately. Um, and equally, that people are empowered to 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 withdraw consent, you know, when when they're not having a good day and, and they don't really want to be there, that they know they don't have to. Mm. Uh, and to, to sort of take a little bit of that pressure that sometimes exists um, and, and move it away. And as much as we're having a very good dialogue right now about mental health in sport um, and, you know, looking after each other, and it, this has been really fantastic over the last few years to see this kind of shift in sports culture, particularly, I should say, in men's sports, see a big shift towards looking out for each other's mental health. I think this has got to be part of that conversation. You know, it's about a slight little shift in culture to um, to put consent more clearly in the uh, in in the spotlight. Hmm. Yeah, and and I think the coach coaches education is important. Are you are you working on that with the with the consent thing at the moment? Um, so uh, sort of. I, I don't want to um, tip my hat too much on this one, but I, I am. Um, uh, consulting with a governing body in the UK, um, a martial arts governing body, on a number of different policy issues, and this is one of the things that we've been talking about. So, uh, hopefully, before too long, this this work will, um, yeah, will work its way into uh, into coach education materials, um, yeah, in in that particular governing body, and hopefully beyond. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's that's really good. I I find it really amazing when you when you find harmony with someone inspiring. I think it's it's amazing. It's kind of a dance in a way that you you are working in harmony even though you kind of want try to break the rhythm but mm -hmm. it's I, i think it's amazing and i think it's not too many people understand correctly the intensity negotiation and it's also speed and rhythm negotiation that you need to stay in certain way if you start for example going slower you cannot change speed in in mid of sparring so I, i think it's uh for many people it's somehow they don't they don't get it exactly and and when you find some people who 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 know how to do it it's it's, it's amazing super super fun when you when you find so i I'm really looking forward that you you will be working on it yes absolutely i, I think it's a really interesting part of the the whole journey of, of research on combat sports is this Uh, it, it takes an insider's perspective. I don't think you can stand from the outside and, and properly understand this. So it's a difficult job, I think, for the researcher to to translate this this um, this embodied phenomenon and put it into words and language that people can understand uh, without having physically done it. Um, and I think that's the task that we set ourselves, isn't it? And I'm certainly not alone in this. There's, there's a lot of researchers who who have studied this particular aspect um, and, and done a fantastic job, I have to say. Um, Many of whose work I cite in in that paper, so uh, you know listeners can uh, can follow up on that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's fantastic, and um, as much as I enjoy training in combat sports, it's it's also a great privilege to be able to uh, yeah to write about them. Mm. Yeah. So this has been super interesting discussions. Do you have any any final remarks? Uh, no, I think we've been going for a while. I think your listeners are probably getting bored <laughs> with the sound of my voice. Uh, but thank you very much again for, for having me on, um, Ollie. And uh, yeah, so happy to share any of the uh, the resources that I mentioned throughout the uh, the discussion. Perfect. This was a pleasure.